every culture has its own form of medicine. Right. And medicine is within a context. Yeah. So within that culture, they call it medicine grounded in their tradition. Hmm. Which means medicine in the Western in the Western context will be the traditional medicine of the people of the West. The West. Okay. Either American or European and so on. And right. a medicine practice in the Indian tradition mm-hmm. will be Indian medicine. Medicine practice in the Chinese tradition will be Chinese medicine. Yeah. And medicine tra- practice in the African context mm-hmm. will be African traditional medicine. Welcome to the show. I am your host, Anya Fombat, and I spark the heart conversations that challenge questionable cultural and societal norms that threaten the well-being of the African community. And I also share stories about growing up as Africans in Africa and in the diaspora. I strongly believe that normalizing open discussions and sharing experiences, whether good or bad, will not only make you find your voice, but will broaden your sense of purpose and empower others to do the same. So if you have ever tried challenging certain African cultural and societal doctrines, or if you have ever felt like it is about time that we confronted these issues in our African community and do better as a people, or even if you have always been interested in learning about the experiences of other Africans growing up in Africa and the diaspora, then you are in the right place. Welcome to Living African. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Living African. Today we will be talking about a very interesting and rare topic and that has to do with traditional medical practices. So I have Professor Pascal Awa who will give a holistic outlook on the idea of traditional practices. So I want to welcome you here to the show. How are you doing today? I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you. So let's just go straight to it. I would like for you to introduce yourself so that the guests can actually have an, you know, get to know you personally before, you know, they hear what you have to say. So Prof, can you please introduce yourself for the people to know you? Yes, I'm, I'm Pascal Awa, a medical anthropologist, professor of anthropology, a bioethicist. Awesome. Thank you very much for coming on to this platform. Now, I'm sure everyone who's listening, they probably are, you know, wondering what is, you know, traditional medicine, you know, I mean, and everything that relates to it. I mean, I know that, you know, some people can have different outlooks on that. Some people can think it's like, like a traditional doctor, for example, can be like a herbalist or a witch doctor or, I mean, whatever people think. They are. So, Professor, what do you think or what will you tell the audience, you know, that traditional medicine is? Yes, what I would tell the audience is that every culture has its own form of medicine. Right. And medicine is within a context. Yeah. So, within that culture, they call it medicine grounded in their tradition. Hmm. Which means medicine in the Western, in the Western context will be the traditional medicine of the people of the West. The West. Okay. Either American or European and so on. And right. a medicine practice in the Indian tradition mm-hmm. will be Indian medicine. Medicine practice in the Chinese tradition will be Chinese medicine. Yeah. And medicine tra- practice in the African context mm-hmm. will be African traditional medicine. Okay. So that is why we call all of it medicine. And then it is when you start talking about that medicine in a context, then it takes that particular culture on board. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for that. We're definitely going to hold that thought because I'm going to get back to it. (laughs) So now in terms of the African context, right? Like... Are there different kinds of traditional medicines in the African context? So will you consider, you know how in like the Nigerian movies, you go to like when people go to like a medicine doctor's house, they have all this, you know, shrines and all these things. Is that part of the African traditional medicine or is that like more of a spiritual medicine or is that just... Like, is, is that a religion? Because here in America, don't quote me on that, but I know like when the slaves came 
here from Africa. I know there are still some states like Louisiana, Mississippi, where the practice of voodoo is actually, which is originated in, from Africa, I believe. It's very, still very prominent. And that actually is a religion. It's not even like a, you know, a cultural thing. It's more of a religion, I think, I believe. But don't quote me on that. So will you think that the traditional aspect of medicine in the African community actually has like different parts to it? If you want to understand the practice of medicine, medicine is there to give us health mm-hmm. and make us healthy. And for you to understand the practice of medicine, you must go into the definition of health, which is very holistic. Yeah. And which says that health is only the absence of a disease in you. Yeah. Medicine is invented or made to give us health. And when we go into medical practice, we need to understand the definition of health, which the World Health Organization makes it very clear. Yeah. Health is not only not only healthy when you don't have a disease in Mm-hmm. You have to be healthy when you are physically, physiologically, mentally, spiritually, and culturally well. Yeah. Which brings on board the issue of wellness. Yes. You need all those components to say they are well. So when they make medicine, is to heal. Yes. Each of the medicines. If you have a disease, you need tablets. If you have a disease, you need surgery. We are talking the Western platform in the western context Mm -hmm. if you have it because when you have a disease you are diagnosed using uh it is declared by a doctor that you have a disease Mm -hmm. and then when you the person who is sick you declare that you are sick or that you have a health problem and you identify what you are sick with or what is worrying you you are giving the definition you are defining an illness you have identified an illness in you and then thirdly, when the society tells you that you have a problem, they're in a way telling you you are sick. So there are three concepts. The concept of disease, which is biomedically defined, illness and sickness, mm-hmm. which illness is defined there by the individual. Sickness is assigned to you by the society in which you live. Mm. And of course, once you understand that, those perspectives and the different dimensions of her then you know how medicine now comes in. If you come into the African context, the African will not will will will, will, will define rather an illness okay, and sickness. And the sickness will require that he goes close to somebody who is a specialist in that field. If the African defines a disease, he says, okay, I have an illness and goes to the hospital, the doctor is going to identify a disease that he has. And of course, he can remain there to take the treatment that the doctor prescribes. But if he is not satisfied, he has already defined an illness. And that illness goes with what? It means that he can do auto-medication or seek help from either a family member or a specialist that identifies with that illness. If the society assigns to him a sickness, it means he has to turn to somebody who is specialized in that field to heal him to treat him, which means shifting from biomedicine, which is the doctor's role, to ethnomedicine, which is grounded on culture, and that would take us to a traditional healer. So when you say society determining an illness or sickness, what basis, sorry, a sign, what basis do you make that um, statement on like what is the criteria that's being used typically for the society to determine that this person has this sickness I asked because I'm going to share with you a personal story and I believe Joy too will share with you a personal story and also the audience of course and we're going to take it from there okay you know the and, who, wait, and who is the society out. sorry the society in which you live the people we, the Africans even in the America society the people even just, in america you know people people move with their cultures yeah so no in america is the doctor the society in this case would be the doctor but in africa we have the doctor and then we it seems like you're saying society so who is yeah. the society and the what society basis to, and they will say hey this person may be having may be mad or he has been may have a mental problem 
On what basis? You know, we, 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 the African science dwells or depends more on clinical observation. And why is that, as if opposed, they have their own culture? As opposed, that is African culture. Depending on clinical observation, is their culture of medicine. As opposed to the Western society, where they depend on clinical trials to determine whether one particular medicine can treat. But in Africa, they depend more on clinical observation. So they observe you very well and see whether you, your life, is in conjunction with the norms and values of that society. So for clinical observation, right, don't you think the people or the society should have some kind of training to know if this person is is okay or not? Because in the West, you said the depend. You said well, first of all, you said the traditional practice. Because I'm I'm not quoting you. I'm just paraphrasing. And if I'm wrong, just you know, let me know. From what you said, it seems like I understand that the traditional practices are based off of clinical observation, right? So, what do you? Yep. What first of all, what will you define as clinical observation? Because the term clinical, clinical is. Um, I would say in this case, clinical could be based off, off of evidence, right? And that evidence has to have root in some kind of science. <laughs> you know what I mean? So because if we are just looking at it like three of us are seated here, three of us are seated here and maybe you can do something and it's not normal to me, but it's normal to Joy. And then I will say, oh, prof has a problem. He needs to go to the doctor. But Joy doesn't see it that way. But then if you went to the hospital, any doctor that sees you, it doesn't matter if I was a doctor or Joy was a doctor, any doctor will come up with the same conclusion based on evidence that you have a problem. So that's why I'm trying to understand the basis on the society because those, a lot of those people may not have the same outlook. And I believe it's important for people to also understand before we move forward to, you know, like breaking it down. Yes, uh, let me say something, uh, Ando, Anyo. Yes, sir. What you should understand is that if you moved from one traditional healer mm-hmm. to another traditional healer, mm-hmm. their diagnosis will be similar. Hmm. Just like if you move from one medical doctor, physician, let me call it that way, to another physician, the diagnosis Will be similar. We are talking about two different cultures of medical practice. Okay. Just like if you are in the Chinese tradition, the Chinese diagnosis, all the doctors will come up with the same or similar diagnosis. So it's the same thing with biomedicine, same thing with Chinese traditional medicine, same thing with African traditional medicine. You are moving from one healer to the other for diagnosis. They'll come up with similar diagnosis. And that is where conclusions are drawn. Let me tell you, a human being does what they call healer shopping. Even in the West, they do healer shopping. Somebody is sick, and he moves from one healer to the other. Okay. Either a healer within the same medical practice or with the same medical perspective, or a healer across medical pra- uh, perspective. For the African, he takes on board all medical perspectives. All right. So... What I can say to that, right, is that for the Western medication, right, the Western cultural medication, I mean, I am a scientist. I am actually a Western, you know, cultural scientist. I'm a pharmacist, so I deal with those medications even more. You are formatted in the Western medical tradition. So you are thinking, you are thinking is around biomedicine. Right. No, my thinking actually is around evidence, you know. Which, yeah, it's, it's part of biomedicine, right? All medicine is based on evidence. Oh, yeah, and, and that's where I'm, I'm headed. All medicine is based on That's where I'm headed. I'm not, I'm not dismissing it. I, I, I just want to just, just, just follow, fo- follow me what I'm trying to say. And when I land, you understand what, I'm, what I mean. So in the West, right, the Western cultural medicine, like, I mean, like I said, I'm a scientist. I went to school for six years, you know, to study medicine literally because i'm a pharmacist i went to school and i studied 
And in terms of the Chinese medicine, there are actually schools to go. That the, if, even here in America, there, you, there are courses in university that has, have to do with Chinese medicine. And you study those, and those are also based on evidence. And it doesn't, I don't even think it matters the kind of medicine, because at the end of the day, even the Western medicine, the pills that we take, they have root from herbs, you know, like, leaves and trees and most of the you know the chemicals come from most of them come from herbs that people go and study in the lab and they come up with evidence right they test these things on animals first and then they have like trials clinical trials like you said as well now in terms of the african or the traditional herbs and stuff like that i don't maybe you can enlighten us i don't know of any school that people go to to determine that you know they're qualified as doctors you know, like for the most part, things have just been, to my knowledge, things have been more based on trial and error than having that evidence, that consistent evidence. Like they go to a, a traditional lab and, you know, get that. So that's why I was trying to know the basis because I still don't understand the basis of African traditional practices from the diagnosis to even the treatment and i'm going to tell you why shortly after i get your response and that will be my personal story because i say that just to also say that i don't think it's an accurate statement to say every traditional doctor will have the same diagnosis just because there's not that consistent basis or evidence or practice that they all go to or they have if there was a school that they all go to to get some kind of qualification we we'll understand that there is some consistent basis on that you know but the fact that it seems um, i'm not trying to use you know tough words in terms of assuming because i don't know we're here to learn right so it seems to me that each traditional doctor has a different approach and a different diagnosis or a different basis there's not like a point a single point of reference so what will you say about that in terms of just that base inconsistency yeah in west africa in fact it is part of the west african that is economic community for west african states is part of their policy that traditional medicine should be part of the curriculum that is the first thing secondly Nobody, I mean, those who are real traditional healers, per se, they don't get up in the morning and start doing traditional medicine. They spend even more years, more than you, the six years that you spend to learn pharmacy. It is an initiation from a very early age for somebody who takes on a career in traditional medicine and moves on through that. Before Chinese medicine became... You know, they started teaching in, in schools as part of curriculum. It went through that process. And China never had any contact with the West, but they practiced their traditional medicine. And when they had contact with the West and decided, you know what, you know the history, I know about communism and so on. When they now became, opened up to the West, then they integrated Western medicine into their traditional medicine. So they were integrating Western medicine into Chinese traditional medicine. Okay. When I lived in one of the Western countries, they started integrating Chinese traditional medicine into Western medicine because they saw that they had a need for it because there was a need from their population. Yes. First, so I want to make it very clear to you that those who are because you can there's a classification of those who practice traditional medicine enough. There's what they will call commonly called tra- charlatans who just get up and then start mm-hmm. start practicing. And you equally in biomedicine, you have people who claim to be ph- ph- pharmacists or me- me- medical doctors when they are not. Well, it depends. It depends on the place because here you can't do that. You need to have a license here in America. But I need, of course, different parts uh, of the world so have different. Af- excuse me, African traditional healers spend more time in training as apprentices under a specialist and who takes them through the different dimensions that that particular specialist knows. And then they do trans cross healer training that he can take his apprentice and send to the other healer 
just like you do, you 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 move from internal medicine to uh, gynecology to surgery and so on and so forth to get training. And that is okay. how they train traditional. That is how they train traditional healers too. Okay. Those who are specialized in spirituality, those who are spiritual specialized in herbal medicine, those who are so they they move around. So it is when when if you want to understand African traditional medicine, remove the Western medical cap from your head. Then you look at African culture and see how things are done. Then you understand it. Yes. And it's just the same like every other medicine. Yeah. So it's, it's to tell you training is done in its sense, not in the Western sense. It's like you will say that Africans never had a system of education. No, we had. No, we had a we, system we of did. education. We it's did. not the formal, the, the Western system of education that we have adopted that makes us be, be educated. So it's the same thing with medicine. Well, yeah, I wouldn't equate that to medicine because medicine has to do with people's health. And, you know, in terms of health changes, people respond differently to different medications and stuff like that. But education is universal, right? Depending, I mean, as long as we, it doesn't matter the system. Medicine is universal. Nah, I, mean, I wouldn't say that. As a scientist, I wouldn't say that. See, look at, look at it this way. Medicine is a universal concept. It is the different types or different branches of medicine right that becomes specific just yes and i started by telling western medicine you have indian medicine you have chinese medicine you have african medicine right okay so just for clarification when you talk about african medicine are you talking about herbalists or you're talking because i personally believe in herbal medicine are you talking about herbalists or you're talking about like which doctor practices like spiritual practices because i think spiritual practices has to do with a connection that you have with the spirits i guess and not necessarily training but herbalist Wait, because i feel like from w- all your responses have to do with like herbal medicine which is very valid there's nothing like we, we what do you mean by which doctors okay which doctor remember when i said you know like when you go to nigerian movies and you see the shrines and like they kill an animal and you know put on there and all of that and they tell you hey you should do this and take this or go and do this and you're gonna be healed and stuff like that that's which medicine basically that's spiritual i thought that was spiritual medicine look at this this way i i, I started by defining to you the definition of if you want to look at her medicine look at it from those perspectives i gave you disease illness sickness one then i said you have disease that's for you to be healthy you must not have a disease you must be physically psychologically mentally spiritually and culturally well Mm -hmm. and each of that the person you see in a shrine is practicing is trying to heal you spiritually spiritually that's what i said he's healing you spiritually and it's just like a pentecostal pastor you go to church and he prays for you and he tells you he's casting out demons that is spirituality and that is healing god the, the main thing about even our religions whether it's christianity islam or african traditional religion or hinduism the main thing is healing healing our souls healing the spirit so when you find somebody in a shrine practicing he's healing you spiritually they may, as I said, they may be charlatans in that field, but they are real ones who are capable of doing that job. Okay, well, then, so I guess we're we're speaking with respect to the real ones now, or the real herbalists and the real spiritual healers. Now, my story is very short. I mean, for those who have listened to previous episodes, they know I have a brother who actually has a disability. He was born okay, but at two weeks he had a seizure and that affected his brain. And so that made him paraplegic, which means, you know, there's one side of his body that's paralyzed and basically he's disabled mentally and physically. So back then in the 90s, it was something that, you know, people had not really seen before and he still has seizures till now and he used to have seizures in the 90s and you know back since my my parents i mean my mom is a medical doctor but it's one of those things that especially in cameroon there were no the 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 healthcare was not that advanced to handle his situation the right way or appropriately so everybody had inputs you know when after they tried the medicine the western medicine and it did not seem to you know 
come up with the results that they were looking for. Now everybody in the community, the families, you know, the family members, everybody was suggesting, oh, go see this person, go see this uh, traditional doctor, this one. And, you know, I feel like that actually caused more harm to my parents. I mean, like I said, my mom is a doctor and she doesn't believe in things like that. But out of desperation, you know, being desperate, especially for your child, can make you do things that you never would have thought of. So one of the doctors that they went to out of desperation told them that my brother was a witch and that the only solution, you know, from that they could do was to put him beside a certain river and they were going to turn him back into what well, they said he was a snake. He was going to turn him back into the snake and he was going to go. Another doctor told my parents that, you know, I think there was even someone was even saying that it was my dad's fault you know, that it was his fault that he sold my, my brother to, I don't know, or something of something of that sort. But it was just one of those things that caused a lot of rift in my family. And, you know, my brother is still alive today. He's still with us. But thinking about everything, if my parents had kept him by the side of that river, you know, don't like they would have probably killed him, you know. So it's just one of those things that, I mean, now when I speak, I hope you can get where I'm coming from because how can you tell which traditional doctor is real or not you know like what basis do they have a certification what training do they have do they like what basis do they even use to make that decision that he is this or he is that or use this on him or use that or do this or do that you know so it's one of those things because we have heard in as much as there are also people who have taken Western medications and died, but at least we know that there was a basis that the doctor gave them those medications. But we've heard time and time again of people that will go to traditional healing. I know people who have died, you know, because they went to the traditional doctor and stuff like that. And they used one, the traditional doctor will say, use this one if it doesn't work. Use this one, use this one. So it's like, it looked to me as trial and error. You know, and nothing ever seemed to work. You know, now we're not talking about the regular herbs that are very common that we even can take the teas and stuff that we know that there's evidence that these things actually work, you know. But when you go to decide to go to a traditional doctor, I know you could tell me that, oh, there are renowned doctors that you can go to who have had, you know, a trail of success in their lives. But before they even had that trail of success, how could you tell if this person was a good doctor or this person was a bad doctor and what you would, what they would tell you and what to believe and what not to believe? So that's my question. Yes, I knew all of us have those testimonies. The testimony of your brother is similar to his testimony that if I start telling you, there's nothing different from what you are saying. I have a case of that day. And so many traditional healers were visited. And people in the communities, they know the right people. But you have so many. You remember for 80% of Africans turn to traditional medicine. You know that. Yeah. And most Africans, they rely on that. They, and the doctor traditional healer ratio is very high, very high here. So I just want to tell you that those t- when you go to the wrong person, then you get a wrong diagnosis. And he will tell you because he needs, he, he, he needs I've told you, their charlatans. He needs his money. Yes. And he'll tell you the right thing. The, us, another person will tell you, hey, please, this child's problem cannot be solved by me. And this child, there that, are that people who are born and they are, they are, I mean, they are condemned to live with their disabilities. Some people will not accept that that is possible, but it is. And so you just need, your mom just needed to see one who was going to say, okay, this is your child, the disability is irreversible. And that will be it. I, I don't even think it was necessarily ir- irreversible. Honestly, I don't think it was necessarily irreversible. He wasn't born. Like, remember I said he wasn't born with that disability. He had seizures. If, honestly, they were in a more advanced country that had the resources to handle him, his case would have been different by now. I feel like it was just because... Finally, it was not an advanced country. Yes, yes, that's what I'm saying. And so it's not like he was born that way and he was doomed to be that way. That's not the case, you know. But the thing is... What I'm trying to say is you, we, we all know that there could be good and bad traditional doctors. But now, what about people who don't have that discernment to know who is good and who's bad? 
if my parents were gullible, they would have left my, my brother and he would have died. You know what I mean? So it's, it, it, it's, it's a very hard, you, you know, it's a very hard thing for me to... You live, you live in the U.S. and uh, there are always reported cases of mal, medical malpractice. Malpractice, but that's based on evidence. That's based on evidence. I mean, if there was evidence, then the, uh, the malpractice will not occur. If, there's, okay. if there was and, evidence, and, the malpractice will not occur. No, no, no. No, malpractice will has potential to occur. First of all, malpractice is subjective because most of the cases... It's not, obs- it's not, it's not okay. sub- No, no, no. L- 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 listen to what I'm saying, uh, Prof, you please. You don't master your field. No. You don't have a master field. Then you, you, you go into malpractice. You, I okay, mean, you do please, the wrong thing. Please, please listen to what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is 100% malpractice, when you're sued for malpractice, but what, what I'm saying is subjective in certain situations, not in all situations. Errors happen. We're humans, right? Errors happen. And that's usually where malpractice comes into play. Or if they missed something, if they missed a certain diagnosis, or if they misused a certain thing, things happen. Like when like, for example, if you're having surgery on somebody on the table, we're all humans. Things could happen, you know, but the decision behind most of those cases are based on evidence and not based, you know, things like malpractice could be based on carelessness, but the evidence is still there. And like I said, every situation is not 100%. Now, why I say it's subjective in certain situations is based on the person who is suing. If I go to the hospital, I actually have a a case, many cases that I went to the hospital and I wasn't treated well. I didn't feel like I was treated well. I didn't feel like I would. they sent me home when I was stable enough. But based on their evidence and based on their protocol practice, I could be stable. But if I don't feel like I'm stable, I can sue them, right? I can sue them based on what I feel, which is subjective. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's actually the right thing that, you know, what I am doing or what I, how I feel was the right thing that they had to do. That's why you see certain patients sue and they lose the cases because it's based on their subjective discernment and they thought that they weren't handled as they wanted to. Because if everybody was handled as they wanted to, it would not, I mean, medicine would just be chaotic. That's what I'm trying to say. And like I said, it's not 100% in every situation. Sometimes it's carelessness, sometimes it's fraud, sometimes it's abuse, sometimes it's just subjective, you know. But at least the baseline, the foundation is that there is some evidence evidence behind every decision that a doctor is making you know yes it is it, it is because you are not trained in traditional medicine that you not come to terms with their practice if you get training like the other physicians african physicians who are trained in africa or pharmacists who are trained in africa mm-hmm. then you understand that there's some evidence in the traditional medical practices things are okay. not done so things are not done. They, they don't play with people's bodies. They don't go out there to say they are doing trial and error. If you want to say it's trial and error, every medicine is trial and error. When you oh, are no. prescribing to somebody, you are not very certain that 100% there's a margin of error in the medicine that you prescribe. So there's no, always trial that's, and that's error. That's not what I'm saying, Prof. We all know that. We all know nothing is 100% you said, perfect. You said African medicine is trial and error. That's no, why I'm that's trying not, to tell that's, you. That's no. not what that's I said. Not. I didn't say African medicine is trial and error. This is what I said. I said, you know, and first of all, I said some of this, you know, there are some herbs because, uh, first of all, a lot of Western medications, they stem from, you know, I would say herbs, you know, like the herbal medicines. Like, you know, if you look at the content of some of the medications, the chemicals that are in some of the medications come from plants, come from, tr- you know, trees and stuff like that. And so we know that there's some, that's why I, I wanted us to really have a clear cut definition and or separate a distinction between herbal practices and spiritual in the African context. You know what I mean? Because I said there are some common herbs actually that even teas that we use even in Africa that help because we already know that there's evidence that this thing help, these things help for these diseases. But you have some doctors, if not most doctors even, that just do trial and error. I didn't say African health medicine in general is trial and error. That's not what I said. I just want to clarify that, you know, because... I mean, like from my own experience, you see two different doctors gave me two dif- gave us two different solutions. And I know people who have actually had cancer and certain diseases, you know, that have 
you know, gone to this doctor and you give him this one and it doesn't, it doesn't do anything. He gives him the other one, gives him the other one and stuff like that. Now, the fact that I don't know the basis that they used to give the medications, that's a problem to me. In Western medicine, there's a basis, there are guidelines for different kinds of diseases. And that's what we're actually talking about in the last episode with diabetes, because I was talking to a, a medical doctor who was talking about now that in our community, we have silent diseases, I'll call them both. In layman's terms, silent diseases like the non-communicable diseases like hypertension, heart disease, diabetes, all these things that are silent, they are not like malaria that you have a headache and you know, you know you're sick, but you can have hypertension and you won't even know, and diabetes. And when people try to seek, you know, like the traditional uh, medicine... Can I, can I say something? Yes. Can I say something? Since yes. you are talking about diabetes. Yeah. I would like to tell you how a traditional healer will diagnose diabetes. You know, it goes with signs and symptoms. Yeah. When you go to him and you describe your signs and symptoms, he, like any other physician, will speculate, will focus that it may be this problem. So if you go with diabetes and you say, okay, your rate of urination is very high, so he starts imagining, oh, it's maybe that sugar. And then he sends you somewhere at the backyard, say, go pee. Then you pee and then he goes and observes. That ants, after some time, ants ants come feed on your urine. That is a diagnosis he makes. And then, listen very carefully, because it is research that I've done. Then he sends you to be very sure of what his diagnosis are. He he tells you, and then to convince you, he tells you, go to a medical facility and get get diagnosis from the doctor. That is from the physician. When you go there, the diagnosis for most of the time is confirmed. Yeah, but... And then you come back. Yes. He has, he has done that and told you what you have is diabetes. It's just to tell you they have a way of diagnosis. And that's okay. why I told you so, they depend more clinical observation okay. to draw their conclusion. I, you know, so the, 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 whole, the whole aspect, I, I, I appreciate that example because the whole aspect of, you know, the ants peeing, you know, ants getting a, around your urine. I mean, that's, they teach us that in school too. So it's kind of a universal reaction, but that does not, that doesn't happen to everybody. That's the thing. It doesn't happen to everybody. So for a traditional doctor in Africa, if that doesn't happen, they will misdiagnose you. But and, and, and I know you're going to say, oh, there's, there's misdiagnosis too in Western, in the Western side. Yeah, like I said, nobody's 100%, you know. You know, that's his observation. So it means that the rate of misdiagnosis will probably be very, very high because in medicine, there's something called the SOAP, SOAP notes, right? I'm not sure if you, you know about that. SOAP means subjective, objective, action, and plan, right? Subjective is what the patient tells you. Right. Because sometimes what the patient tells you may not necessarily be what it is. Right. Like, for example, I have a newborn. I just had a baby two months ago. My baby had diarrhea and I was freaking out that the baby could have a belly ache or belly issue. And I kept communicating with the doctor from my own observation it's subjective. Like I feel like the the child is sick. But now the doctor's own objective review is based on clinical evidence. That objective review they do lab work, they do the tests to make sure, or they use their experience from previous cases and studies that have been made and done to do that objective analysis. And when they do it now, they come up with their diagnosis based off of that evidence that they have collected. And when they do the diagnosis, they come up with an action. What are we giving based on this diagnosis? And then the plan is what they explain to the patient. This is the plan. You're going to take this medication three times a day or how many times a day? In my own case, the doctor just said, no, that's normal. That's normal for babies, you know, because they, of evidence. But if I went to a traditional doctor, for example, how can they tell that that's normal? What evidence are they using? You know, because sometimes actually a baby can be sick with the, with the diarrhea, you know what I mean? But just because two different babies have diarrhea doesn't mean that one is not sick and one is sick. You have to have like some detailed evidence. I honestly think that there is a point to African traditional medicine. I'm not dismissing it at all, honestly, because there is always a basis. And what because I really think there was a point because even before Western medicine came to Africa, Africans had their own medicine, you know, and somehow it worked. But what I am really trying to understand is the basis like you know 
how did they do it? Like, how, what is that basis that, what, 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 what did they base that off of? You know, and especially with, with advancements that have happened, I would think that maybe there should also be advancements in traditional medicine in terms of like, okay, we have used this herb, we have used this spiritual thing to heal this person. Let's look into it and try to, to see why this is happening. The curiosity behind those things, I feel like that's what leads to advancement, you know, and that's why it's hard for me to just understand. And I really wanted you to, you know, to give that perspective on that. So it's not like I'm trying to be dismissive. Yes, I'm saying when Europe and America were struggling with Mm COVID-19, the Africans had a way, a breakthrough. And I I was one of those in the African Union Tax Force to research into African remedy, what Africans were capable of doing. And we did. Even before the vaccine came, Africans were ready to like step in with evidence from clinical observations to from a clinical observation to clinical trials. They did that mm-hmm. and were ready to wear in and each country, the African Union was going to take, make as a resolution to say, okay, let's start trying this. Then the vaccine came and the scheme was dropped. So I think that is an advancement. Where did these people, where did the sci- clinical scientists get this knowledge? It's because they worked very closely with traditional healers and tapped on this knowledge and said, okay, mm-hmm. if this is possible, let's try, in the, let's, let's try it in our labs. They tried mm-hmm. it in the work. Yeah. But then the vaccine... The vaccine initiative last year in January came and eclipsed and dismissed everything. And that's why everything is still hanging. As you would have heard about breakthroughs with COVID-19. Yeah. So th- for that, there's an advancement. And, and, and I, want to, I, I, want, I equally want to tell you, because you see, like, in the past, Africans depended very much mm-hmm. on spiritual healing mm-hmm. traditionally. That is be grounded on our culture. But Christianity has come, yeah. and you have Pentecostal pastors who have moved that initiative and yeah. shifting the patients from traditional healers to yeah. churches, coastal churches. So yeah. you see that shift. That shift is equally there. Yeah. So that is transformation. That is emergence of new initiatives yes. from a particular platform. Yes, that is very yeah. true. I, I to- 100% agree with you. And that's what's sparking my curiosity because, I mean, of course, I've read so many articles. It's obvious that you know, a lot of the medications right now, and that's why I said this turn from herbs, a lot of scientists work with traditional healers, right? You know, to come up with these advancements. And also, I've always had this curiosity. And if you have anybody that can speak on it, I will really, really be grateful about the practices. That's why I brought up voodoo. Because voodoo was actually, from what I've read, and don't quote me or you can correct me, voodoo actually is a spiritual practice and it stemmed from, I think, Africa, you know, and that was part of our religion. That was part of our practice that we had, you know, before the Western people came and brought Christianity. So I'm really curious about life before the Western people came, like the practices that we had, because we were good. We were okay. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm trying to really kind of comprehend, you know, what that switch was and how that impacted our life post-Christianity. You know, okay. that's... Let me, just, let me just take you back to my definition of her. Mm-hmm. Because you, that will be, always be a good springboard for you to understand anything concerning yeah. medicine and her. You know, the, the, the spiritual dimension of her, you, ask, you, are, you, you, you develop, you are sick, you go to the hospital, you go through so many hospitals, so many specialists, and they don't get any disease in you. And you are like desperate, you don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. Then, like what happened to my they, parents? No, listen, let me, let me just explain it to you. Mm-hmm. The next thing is, in Africa, you actually meet a specialist who diagnose and say, hey, after listening to you very carefully, you may, the diagnosis may come out that, there is the link may be with your parents or the link may be with your ancestors. Hmm. And it is sufficient. In fact, for you to understand this, watch Nigerian Pentecostal church healings where you find a Pentecostal pastor asking 
the patient, I mean, the, 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 the person who came and tabled his complaint, or who is being healed, telling him to go back and reconcile with the parents. And it's sufficient for you. And that's what many traditional healers do. When they listen to you and get your story, mm-hmm. they're able to tell you, hey, you have a problem with your parents. Your, your problem is your parents. Maybe you, they, they've sent you to school, you are going to school, you are working, and then at one point you are feeling guilty that you are not taking care of them. And when you go, and you are not, effectively you are not doing anything for them, you have not improved on their livelihood, whereas they spent all their resources on you. When you go back to your parents and you say, well, the doctor has told you, you are my problem. That is why I'm not seeing, I'm not having a way forward in my life. It is sufficient for your father to say, or your mother to say, well, that being the case, you take water, put in the glass, give you, and you drink. And in the next one or two days, you are well. That water alone is your medicine. And that reconciliation is alone. That is a spiritual aspect, the mental and spiritual aspect of it. Just like, okay, we are used to having successors and so on and so forth. Then your parents die and then you abandon everything. And you see, Understanding where your problem is, is the first thing. And those who can effectively diagnose and tell you, exactly, and we are talking to the real people, mm-hmm. are the healers who will tell you, well, the spiritual healers who will tell you, this is a problem. Your problem is your ancestors. Your problem is your parents. Your problem is your community. Mm-hmm. Or you stole from somebody's farm. You have to go back and reconcile. Once you reconcile, you feel healed. But no, yeah. med- no physician in the hospital will be except one he, tra- trained who has gone and gotten training in that particular aspect will be able to tell you when you have an issue. And I, I've, I've been like a, an, a medical anthropologist. I've been calling to the hospital mm-hmm. so many times to listen to patients. Mm-hmm. And I listen to patients and turn and tell the physicians, the real problem of this patient is not what you are given these tablets or injections for. The real problem is this. And then another one, you are poor, you don't have money, mm-hmm. you've lost your job, you become depressed. The only thing to heal you is to have a new job and you are healed. So those are, the, those are those little things in health that you have to understand from the mental and spiritual aspect of it. Mental goes with the spiritual. This is, I think this is a non-ending debate, <laughs> you know, and I wouldn't even say it's a debate because I, I really want to, like, I, I'm really hungry to learn and know, you know, the other side of things, you know, and that's why I have all these questions that make it seem like I, I'm challenging that, that ideology, but I'm not. I actually, I'm using my, what no, I, I know. I, I, I really love your questions. It's like, it's like being in a, in a, in a amphitheater and talking to my students. Yeah. And they're asking those type of questions they are asking. I feel very happy facing them and answering them. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's, those are questions I take every day. Yeah. And, 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 and I would imagine. American students or yeah, students of anthropology or in other fields. Yeah. I mean, I would imagine everyone is curious to really know, you know, that that's why I said, if you know anybody who can really speak about the religious practices pre prior to Christianity, I would greatly, greatly appreciate it. But I just want to thank you very much, Prof, for really taking that time to have this conversation. Um, How can the people reach you, reach out to you if, you know, if the audience want to, you know, reach out to you? What is the best way to reach out? I think by WhatsApp or by Zoom. Oh, okay. So... Is there like a number or can you say a number that people can reach out to you? And this number will be published on our website if that's okay with you. For that's plus 237-690-5959-48. Okay, thank you. And so that's basically mm-hmm. the best way to reach out to you. Is there like a professional email that you use that people can maybe send you an email or something? A regular email, which is just my name, our Pascal Adiao.fr. Okay. And Pascal is P-A-S-C-H-A-L, correct? Yes, exactly, yes. All right, thank you so much, sir, for that. And I hope to speak to you again and again. And I'll catch you on the next episode. You have a good day.
That's it for today. Thank you for listening to our show. If you want to participate in the show or find out more helpful resources, then visit www.livingafricanpodcast.com for more information or email us at hello at livingafricanpodcast.com. Also, don't forget to connect with us on all social media platforms at Living African Podcast. You can also connect with Anyo directly on Facebook or Instagram at Anyo Fombard. Thanks again for listening and let's not forget to be more understanding and nicer to one another.